EC studio after some crazy events yesterday. The whole league is turned on its head. The Poros are here to see it all, and uh, we can barely wait to see what today will bring. Thank you to our Poros for being in the audience while other people can't. We appreciate it a lot. Now, um, as for yesterday and today, one thing we can be sure of is it's going to be one hell of a ride. It was absolutely crazy. And if we had said to you before the start of summer that this is what the top three would look like and that Fnatic and G2 wouldn't be at the top of the tables, you would have called me crazy, Dracos. And it's not just Mad Lions and Rogue, it's SK Gaming, it's Origin being so far down, it's the struggle or Team Vitality even starting to turn their split around. The entire league feels like it's been completely shifted. There is pretty much nothing that you can take from spring that is reliably transferred over to summer. Yeah, spring means nothing, summer is everything, and I feel like that we could call it perhaps a new generation of players, oh, Sharks. We? Yeah, well, I've been coining this uh, <laughs> amongst the crew this week, uh, as I feel like we should look through everything today in the next coming weeks as the new generation, because we so often talk about the rookies in EU, and yes, they always show up, but not all rookies are created equal, and not all of them keep on performing in the years to come. And I think what we see now is the start of the new generation, those players that have been around now for a year or two years that are really showing how strong they are. I feel like for a very long time, we've had new players sometimes incorporated into good teams, and they've kind of grown alongside those good teams. But very rarely have we seen new rosters with a bunch of new players rise up to actually challenge these top spots. And sure, we're only in week three, but I think based on what the standings look like and how the competition has been going, I feel like we're only seeing a continued rise of newer players that have only joined the league in the last year contesting for that title spot. Yeah, let me just jump in here because I think a lot of people will also say, and I've thought it, well, hey, it's the beginning of the split. It's the first couple of weeks we usually see this. Things are not what they seem. But there's a distinct feeling in me that that is not the case. It is not the same as the things we've seen the previous seasons. And it's hard to say, right? Yeah. But I do feel that a lot of these teams are showing the fruits of the labor and of the basics that they have laid down in previous years. They absolutely are. And also, in the past when we've excused losses, especially from teams like Fnatic and G2, it's been like one loss in one crazy game where we sure. went, ah, they're three and three. These teams are showing up, they are not messing around, and no more is it the G2 and Fnatic kind of win by default unless you have a mastercrafted plan against them. You have to work hard for these wins right now. Now, of course, Fnatic and G2 do have the pedigree that we will continue to give them the benefit of the doubt until they sure. lose the split. Yeah. Because as they've both demonstrated, even when they're looking weak, they somehow manage to win out on these best of fives, on these regular season performances, and they end in the top spot. So there's still a long road, but I am so excited as to what Mad Lions and Rogue are doing today, especially after their performance yesterday. Yeah, we can just focus on, on the results we have right now. And one of those yesterday was SK beating G2. SK, for me, is hands down the biggest surprise. I did not have a lot of faith in kind of the roster moves, or let's put it differently, I had no expectations, right? Sure. And, and they've done phenomenally with what they brought, and they beat G2 just yesterday. I mean, let's look at the context of the change that they made. They brought in a new rookie mid laner, and they moved their former mid laner to top. Expectations were that they would not just steamroll over G2, they wouldn't be sitting third in our standings, but they are playing standard, they're playing a style that works for them, and I feel like they're great at punishing the mistakes that their opposition made, which was perfect against G2 yesterday. And this is the team that struggled to pick up the four wins that they did have in spring. So yeah. to keep so many components to make such a small change, I was one of the big critics of them not making more changes, but you can see how I was proven wrong by such an incredible first few weeks from this SK lineup. Uh -huh. uh, Matt, of course, in the same breath, like such an exciting team to watch. Yesterday, they topped it off by beating Origin. You know, they just beat all the top teams, the middle teams, the lower, they don't care. It was an incredible game for Mad Lions. They deserve an immense amount of credit for that one. I feel like Origin had the perfect path ahead of them to close out that game, but Mad found a way. They found the team fight when it mattered most. They did not let the KL hit level 16. And when it came to highlight mechanical moments, Kaiser looked like an absolute monster that game. And finally, Rogue yesterday took down Fnatic. Uh, we were always saying, hey, they can't take down the top teams. They're not that threatening. Well, they've done it now a few times. And yesterday, they took down Fnatic. Yeah, and they still do have a tough road ahead of them. They're going up against Mad Lions later today. Uh, but I think that Rogue are starting to showcase more evolution. That was one of the big criticisms we had from them early in the year, which is they were not evolving as a team. And unless they did, they wouldn't be able to challenge the top spots. 
Pirates. They're showing that evolution. They're getting more aggressive. And Larson is a god. I cannot wait to see him progress throughout the rest I, of the I just got to double down. Larson <laughs> is a god. <laughs> we have to say it again. That Rise performance was clutch. This man has showed up in a big way, and it's no longer just the quirky Azir wait to late game story. I have so much faith in Larson right now. I'm also so happy that we just spent this whole like news block we have on Ready Check just talking about kind of not the teams that you usually expect to talk about. It's also Our very refreshing. exciting, Sharks. It's so great. Lit. It's <laughs> great. But now I'm going to convert you, if you're not already, to uh, fans of Mad Lions. I want you to be on the Mad Lions hype train. And why? Because the Mad Lions, they're just playing out of their mind right now. They beat Origins just yesterday, and they have only lost to G2 in their opening game of summer. So that was a while ago. Now, they've also beaten Fnatic, yes, but let's be real. It's more impressive that they've beaten some of the teams actually performing now, like SK. Uh, but in short, the Mad Lions team fight synergy is stellar. They go hard or go home. They are inventive in their drafts. What is not to like? Now, on top of that, they have some stellar individual players. And I'm going to be the first to admit that I wasn't the biggest fan of Humanoid at the beginning of the season. I thought, well, hey, look, the Mad Lions, they have this new invigorated lineup. Why did they pick up this guy? I think he's good, but where is his ceiling? And man, was I wrong. Humanoid is crushing it right now in the mid lane. First in damage per minute, first in damage percentage, first in kills plus assist at 15, first in CSDs at 15, but you don't even need the the stats. You just need to watch the games and also know that he is a leader amongst these rookies and amongst these new players. And one of those new players that is also doing phenomenal is Kaiser. He is part of that new generation of supports who is not afraid to push the boundaries in terms of picks and playstyles in combination with great mechanics. And I think that Kaiser could very well be the best support in the league at the moment. He had another stellar performance yesterday. Now, I think that is enough to get hyped about the Mad Lions, but if it isn't for you to get you on the Mad Lions hype train, imagine this. Their development as a team embodies the LEC values completely. A motivated squad of new generation players backed by a great coaching staff willing to break the boundaries and dream of what they could achieve at Worlds. The Mad Lions, uh, they are the real deal, but I don't necessarily think that I have to convince my co-anchors here. No, you no, you don't. You, you don't. And I think the other <laughs> values we need to point out are memeing and trash talk, in which case they both succeed in that as well because Harzi <laughs> is hilarious and these boys That's aren't true. afraid to take a challenge head on. Shadow's also adorable. So even if all of the gameplay stuff doesn't get you, they're just honestly an entertaining I team. I love that you also highlighted Kaiser. Yesterday, I think he put on a clinic and I think that it is so important to recognize this man has played top lane half the split. Like he's been playing <laughs> top lane champions. He's been managing side waves. The dude is like so talented and so versatile what he could do and I think that he's still got so much more to show us. So I'm all aboard the Mad Lions hype train. I hope that they can take it all away, and I'm really excited. To see Me too, and they're up first is that other hype train team, Rogue, later today. So that's going to be an absolute banger. And something that Mad Lions and the other top teams, for that matter, have in common is their great objective control, because you got to get those objectives if you want to win those games. And with that, we wanted to take a closer look at some Baron setups, and everyone at home can join the discussion. And you should weigh in on if the team should do Baron, yes, or if they shouldn't, no. You can spam yes or no in chat, but I, of course, have my esteemed colleagues. The first example is from Misfits Gaming. Drop the freeze frame production. Let's see. All right, what do we got? Vettius, why don't you kick us off? All right, so whenever setting up a Baron, the first thing you've always got to look at is the vision. And when we're looking at Misfits, you can see they've got a couple of wards sprinkled in here. They've got that one blue ward on the red buff. They've also got the top wave pushed in. They've got some control wards in the river. Initially, things look good. The problem is they're not threatening the enemy jungle, which gives Fnatic access and a potential steal, which right now is where my concern comes for Misfits. Mm. And in theory, having a Callista should deny the potential steal. It's important to note there's a Cho'Gath on the enemy team, but he does not have teleport. So if Misfits were very fast in taking this, in theory, you can yes. mitigate the risk. But that said, it, they don't take it very fast. It's a Callista and a Zoe, not the most sustained damage from that Zoe. OK, what is chat saying? So they do Baron? No, 64%. Well, of course, <laughs> to be fair, to be fair, fair Baron's we've games. all seen. Yes, uh, yes. I <laughs> remember how this one ends. All right, let's play it out. Here we go. I think it starts fine. You know, if everybody's so holding him the, off. The problem is, at this point, 
Look at how close Fnatic are to challenging it. This is now a 50-50 rather than a clean Baron take. And Misfits, a team that was in the lead, put themselves in a position where they could throw the game and ultimately did. So I think chat hit the nail on the head this time. I think Misfits too, took too much of a gamble on this I think play. this is the good face, like, uh. Yeah, it's an awkward, that but awkward also, face. In your like professional analysis of how this should go, you would you have incorporated thought of the Ezreal stealing? The no. No, no, I thought Cho'Gath would steal it. If yeah, I mean, yeah, like, 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 so I think this is one of those things that if Misfits were a more veteran team, I still don't love the Baron, but I trust them to execute with the Callista Rent at the right time to deny any potential steal. Because Blipo doesn't have flash, he can't get into that pit. That said, when you're not 100% confident in how much damage that Kliss is going to do, it's no longer a guaranteed Baron secure. You're kind of just spitballing and hoping that it works out. All right. Well, uh, the Misfits have probably VOD reviewed that one. Let's take a look at the next Baron spam in chat, if they should do it yes or no. What do we got? Oh, no, wait, wait, no. Okay. <laughs> it's Misfits again. <laughs> misfits again. L listen, this, is, this huh. has to be. Okay. There are some TPs up, but they're all full health. They're, they have to back. There's no way they can give this. So the important thing to note this time is if we have a look at the vision, you can actually see on the minimap the rewards littered behind the Baron pit, which give Vitality a lot of options to TP back in. Now, if NG dies in this play, which I do believe he does, then this play becomes a little bit more favorable. But I do feel that you have to bring into question if the enemies can approach the Baron, how safe is the Baron? But they TP behind them. But that's yeah, not that's, really... That's the big thing. Because I think that without a true tank and without a significant amount of lifesteal on your respective carries, you're just going to take so much damage here that if anyone comes to disrupt you, your life becomes very difficult. Look, hey. They oh, should do bear. I mean, I mean again, again, they should do bear. Again, I think Chad is looking at this and they're saying, okay, if Let's the jungler go. dies, like jungle is dead, this is looking pretty good. Let's go. Right? And, but again, Started. I think the biggest concern is these TPs, the fact that they can come in. And at this point, I feel like Misfits have to disengage. And because you can see, like, <laughs> it's no longer just one team doing Baron. It is a fight oh. happening around the Baron buff. And this is the risk that happens. Like, if the if the enemy can be close enough that they can challenge the Baron, it's not a good Baron anymore. So, but... But, okay, here's my thing. Yeah. Is that while I agree, that should have been their Baron, Dosh should have body blocked... No, but you can't make that no, argument. No, 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 no. Okay, you but you can, you, can, you can tell... I can say that the execution was poor because... They put themselves in a position to get hit by the Corky over the wall. Yes. If you sacrifice Doss, your jungler's alive, and in theory, you can take it. Was it still a very high risk, Baron? Yes. But the reason it looks so comically bad is because they also play it kind of poorly. Kind of, I'm, I'm going to say, yes, you voted yes. Chat voted yes. Yes, they could have done it. They got <laughs> I, the TPs. I'm a hard yeah, no, 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 We know what happened. <laughs> they, it was the wrong choice. No, but they didn't get the Baron, but they also didn't get aced. They got the TPs out from the <laughs> I mean, enemy team. They chased the enemy team into their jungle. No. I think this is okay. They bought more time for Kale to okay. hit level 16. <laughs> they baited by Tally. I feel like you two are just trying confidence. to talk to those solo queue players. It's big like, brain. Guys, the Baron wasn't my fault, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what's happening. All right, uh, finally, from the team with the best Baron control in the league, <laughs> spoiler production, Rogue. All right, what we've got here. Okay, so let's have a look at this setup again. Vision control. Looking pretty good for Rogue. Great. Larson is right next to a ward that he can very quickly clear out. There is a double TP on the side of... Who are they playing against? Vitality. Vitality. Uh, so there is that risk that you have to take into consideration, but the wards are not close, so right now, no one is challenging Rogue. It's also... They have a lot of sustained well, uh, damage. This, this is that... Um... <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, uh, that last, uh, ignore that last number on the right hand uh, side. That wasn't supposed to come up yet. Yeah. But uh, it's a low risk situation. They have a tanky front line. They have two very high sustained sources of damage yep. to shred through the Baron. So this is a no risk start. The only thing yes. that matters is do you decide to pull off if you're contested? Yeah, and I think this is what's interesting comparing this Baron to the last Baron that we saw. And notice how, as we roll the clip, that Rogue will actually choose to disengage from the Baron, recognizing, oh, all the Vitality are approaching. Now, of course, what we know is that Vitality had the split push comp, and Rogue's game plan here is to try and get TPs out from the opposition. And at this point, you're like, okay, this is a gamble now. This is risky. But rather than taking the gamble, Rogue get the teleports out from Vitality, and then they immediately disengage. And this is what I call a good utilization of Baron because there's no gambles. There's no 50 50s. So this is a good one, but the Misfits one was a bad one and ended up being the same thing? No. The <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, uh, I see you. You, uh, you tricky comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got one. you. Hey, 
Uh, Rogue haven't lost a single Baron this split. Their objective control is stellar. It's insane. Uh, so we'll see how the teams do with the Barons today. But with Summer deciding the four LECs LEC seeds, that's hard to say. At Worlds, uh, the race for playoffs is now more important than ever. And Medic is going to walk us through how the field is looking right now. Thank you very much, Shox. Now we're a third of the way through the split and we're already starting to see some of the playoff picture develop. So I thought I'd give you a quick rundown on how things are gonna work this summer. As per usual, the top six teams in the regular season will qualify for playoffs and fight for one of four places we have at Worlds. Now, historically, you've needed about eight or nine wins to make it into playoffs, with seven being the least a team has had and still made that cut. And this is why we keep talking about how important it is to pick up early wins over the first few weeks of a season. Now, some of the more observant of you may be wondering, well, what's happened to the regional gauntlet where we traditionally decided our last seed into Worlds? This year, there is no gauntlet. It doesn't exist. If you don't make playoffs, you don't make Worlds. You're out, you do not pass go, you do not collect 200 euros. So what about championship points, I hear you ask? Well, let Dr. Medic explain. Teams collect championship points based on their positions in the spring and summer regular season. First gets the most points all the way down to sixth place. These points are then used to decide the seeding for the summer playoffs. The team with the most championship points will get first seed, so on down the list. The points a team gathered in spring will only impact their seeding into playoffs if they place in the top six in summer. It doesn't matter how you placed in spring, if you end below sixth in summer, uh, summer split, you don't get in, even if you have more championship points than a team above you. So what about playoffs? Well, our playoffs format is the same as it was in spring, with first seed getting the choice of third and fourth and so on. But the biggest change is how important the upper bracket has become. A single series win in the upper bracket guarantees you world, because the lowest you can place is fourth place. Now, I'll make sure to check in more with you throughout the course of the split, but if you remember one thing from today, remember this. The top four teams in playoffs make worlds. And if you don't make top six in the regular season, you have no chance of making it to Worlds. Two teams who have proudly represented Europe at Worlds in the past are Fnatic and G2, and later today, they clash in our match of the week. Oh, Reckless dodged the petrifying gaze from Perth! G2 are destroying! We managed to take down Perth! Fnatic are popping off, and G2 don't get a chance! And G2 by three! The Yankos no hope, remember, he can't get out of this. G2, the perfect team fight! Slides his way in and flashes forward with Bo. And it's Fnatic who are coming out on top! Decimal suit, that means gonna go down. Oh no, Reckless jumped away from him! The Yankos will be shot down. Here comes the charging from the side, and G2 can do nothing about it! Low here as well, Caps might look for that true shot barrage. Janko's gonna jump into the pit, he goes on top, and he steals it! G2 are inevitable, G2 are inescapable. Snatching the record set by Fnatic, seven titles for G2. I think mostly it's in our own heads, and that's something we have to figure out, obviously, because the goal here is to be G2 and to get the trophy back. Even right now, winning LEC is not like something big, it's more about beating G2. And then comes the most important thing, which is winning Worlds, right, and becoming the world champion. Like right now, we're just playing our own game, where we have to keep staying ahead of everyone else. And that's always harder than it is to catch up to someone. Fnatic has always had problems with drafts in that sense of like being stubborn on picking up champions. And they're probably forcing themselves to pick up new champions to be ready for whichever meta that, that will be. Regardless of what we would have played on that day, we would have still lost 0 3. So it just felt like they had a better strat there, basically. When you make it all the way to the LEC finals, that's like one of those high points in your climb. You're gonna drop down at the end of the start of summer anyway, right? You're gonna to have to start where everybody else starts. Just because you lost the, the finals doesn't mean that you can't climb back up. Fnatic is a team that we need in Europe because we need to be challenged in every play if we want to compete against LPL because they play really aggressive as well. 
there is no better rivalry right now in League of Legends because you look over LCK, your SKT and your KTs are not at the top. EDG and RNG, they're not at the top. CLG and TSM, they're definitely not at the top. I'm really, really excited to see which one of the two is actually gonna put the, the other one into the dirt. So the fact that Europe has G2 and Fnatic, and then how competitive they have been also on a global scale, that's what makes this the best rivalry in League of Legends right now. What a powerful video. And what I really, really enjoy is that the editors have used clips from the past when these teams were actually. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say something really nice about how much like I miss. The thing I love about international competition more than anything is that, especially once you get past the group stage, it feels like all of Europe bands together. Yeah. And even if you're a G2 fan, you can still be proud of that Fnatic IG final. But yeah, also they're 3 3 right now. So yeah, whatever. So, <laughs> excuse uh, We just, you know, you got to make some jokes sometimes because we can almost never joke about these teams. And we do have trust that they'll get back on top. But right now, it's not the best League of Legends we're seeing from either side. Vinny. No, I think one of the big sentiments that fans are expressing right now is that the drafts are a little wonky. And I think that we've heard from Fnatic saying that we want to experiment, want to try new things. We heard from Cap saying that it feels like Fnatic is trying to expand their pool more. And when you look at G2, I feel like it's a lot more of an individual inconsistency performance where different members are showing up at different times and we're not getting the same cohesive G2 every single week. That said, whenever they play against each other, I feel like you get some of the best League of Legends that you can get. And it feels like they just awaken a different beast in one another because it means so much to win against their rival. They're just two of the most adaptable teams in League of Legends and definitely the two most adaptable teams in Europe. And that means that even when a game on, between and to any other teams feels like it's over at 15 minutes because there's some kind of gold lead, it's never over till it's over in a G2 Fnatic game. And I think what's crazy about it is one of these teams has to go 0-2 this oh, week, that's and true. that's going to mean a lot for both of them. Yeah, definitely, and uh, I want to also keep this context that we've been using for ReadyCheck about the new generation. They're breathing down their necks because G2 and Fnatic, they're closing out the week and they're the match of the week, but right before that, it's maybe the actual match of the week. <laughs> Rogue and Mad Lions facing off in the battle for first the battle of the best, as Draco's dubbed it. So as we look at the schedule, it's packed from start to finish. Yeah, it's a little, a little heavier at the end there, for sure, <laughs> at the start. But yeah, it's going to be an absolutely crazy day. I'm really excited to see a special shout out to Game 3, where I may have jinxed upset by saying all the pressure is on him. Because if he gives Shaga their first win, that'd be really embarrassing. Uh, he wasn't a big fan of that sentiment, but yeah, it's going to be a great day. It will. Well, SK Gaming, they are looking to continue their run in the first game. So let's get some more insight from their support limit. And thank you very much, Shox Law, here joined by Limit ahead of SK's first game today against Vitality. Thank you very much, Limit, for joining me. Thank you. You had the best start at uh, week three yesterday with the victory against G2. So how, how was it for you now that you had time to let it sink in? I mean, uh, beating G2 is obviously really, it's a really great feeling, right? They're a uh, really decorated team and just beating them means a lot for me and uh, mm -hmm. our team. Uh, what made you win exactly? Like, how were you the better team yesterday? Uh, I think we had a good prep. Uh -huh. We rewatched all of them games. We knew how they play. Uh, they kind of surprised us with what they wanted to pick. We really didn't think they would go with the custom mid. So I think this really changed mm -hmm. and made it kind of easier for us. Uh, but we still had a really good preparation and, and we were confident after the draft that we were in a really good situation, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean, we could, we could see it. You were confident the whole game. You were dominating them, basically. And it must be strange as a newcomer in the LEC to already match the top players in the league. So how was it for you, especially as one of the rookies in the LEC? 
Uh, I mean, playing against these players is kind of the standard for me right now. Of course, I, I've been playing solo queue against them like for quite some time. Obviously, team game against G2 is a completely different story. They're really like, these guys are a team that basically, even if they're 5k down, you need to be <laughs> careful. <laughs> and we were just really happy and relieved when we took the Nexus down. Uh, I can just imagine, yeah. I mean, yeah, you have to be aware constantly. We know how uh, uh, how much strong G2 can be whenever they want to come back. And I mean, you were successful here yeah. and SK has been pretty successful uh, since the beginning of the split here. And I I think you're one of the big parts through this success. So tell me about the first weeks with SK and w your role within this lineup. I mean, I can say that we definitely improved since like uh, spring split. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think me working much more with Crowny and us understanding the, the, the meta and uh, how we want to play really helped shape the team in the direction we want to play in. Yeah. And yeah, I just feel more confident than the spring split. Nice, nice. And uh, that's very good to hear. And compared to the other EU supports, I mean, they've been learning for a while and I hear people already comparing you to the likes of Hilisang, maybe Miki sometimes. So <laughs> yeah, within the first year being compared to these guys, how does it feel? And how do you see yourself in the LEC? I mean, I think it's still kind of too much to say that mm -hmm. right now, of course, like this guy, uh, me, uh, these guys have proved a lot. They have really good results behind them, but I'm happy that people think this <laughs> and I'll just have to <laughs> prove it, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah. Hum humble reply. Uh, I will take this one. Thank you very much, Limit, <laughs> for the interview and uh, good luck today yeah. against Vitality. Thank you. And for more on Limit and what he offers to SK Gaming, let's send it over to Vedius. Thank you very much, Law. Now, for a long time at the LEC, we have had a drought of new supporters challenging the established top two of Hillisang and Mickey. This summer, I truly think the floodgates have opened and we are starting to see the next generation of great supports coming from Europe. Now, people may compare limits to some of the flashiest supports in the league, focusing on Kaisa's big Wukong engages or Hillisang's sick hooks, and wonder why he's in the conversation as a top tier support. What Limit brings is not purely about mechanically sound plays. His style is focused around setting his team up for objectives, funneling gold onto crown shot in the early game. Limit spends most of most of his time any support near his jungler early on, and actually spends the least near his AD carry. However, he uses this time to develop huge goal leads for crown shot, with SK bot laner averaging almost 1,000 goal lead at 15 minutes. I'm going to show you this clip that perfectly demonstrates what I'm talking about. Now, after, this, after taking their second dragon of the game, Limit immediately pushes into the G2 jungle, getting key deep vision to spot out Yankos on these two wards. When SK know that Yankos isn't coming to the bot lane, both Limit and Trick use the Blast Cone to get over the wall and force G2 away from their bot lane tower. This sequence of events isn't about getting kills. It's about making sure Crown Shot is as safe as possible when he pushes up for this bot lane tower so that SK can be sure he's going to get all of that plate gold before plates fall off at 14 minutes. Now, Limit may not be the flashiest support in our league, but this split, he is a key to SK's successes. And in my opinion, he's on the rise to becoming one of the best supports here in Europe. Now, we'll see if SK's success continues against Vitality as we leave it to the casters for picks and bans.